Oh, thanks, Tim, and thank you uh, very much. And it really is a uh, honor to be part of this. Uh, as everyone knows, Joey was not only a special person for the Edmonton Oilers, but um, for the people of Edmonton and for the province of Alberta, and for that matter, everyone in Canada. Um, I was probably lucky enough in a sense that uh, I grew up um, in Brantford and my dad's sister was uh, mentally challenged. Um, as my dad said back in that era, we called it uh, Down syndrome, but today's day and age, uh, mentally challenged is the proper terminology. So when I met Joey, I was extremely comfortable. Um, I understood his uh, sort of mindset and I'd kind of grown up with it. So when um, Glenn Saylor was kind enough to let Joey jump on board, uh, come and work in the locker room, we didn't anticipate him being there for 35 years with not only the Oilers, but of course, how nice the Edmonton uh, football club um, has been to Joey. And, um, you know, he brought a, ray of sunshine and a lot of uh, fond memories to all of us. And I had so many people over the last 24 hours reach out, talk about how exciting Joey was to be around. And, um, you know, that Joey had lived probably a really wonderful life. But as I said to them, you know, he made our lives better. Uh, it wasn't just us making his life better. Without question, he made our lives better. Um, I said it before, uh, there was nothing better than having a cup of coffee before practice with him, uh, him talking about life and his aunts and his family and his mom, uh, to playing the games and losing tough games and him t tapping you on the shoulder, telling you not to worry about it. We'll win tomorrow. Um, so <clears throat> he's a special man. And, um, uh, as I've said before, I'm not sure his impact, uh, what we'll, we'll really realize, because obviously he opened doors for a lot of kids across Canada and North America. But more importantly, I think what he did best was he gave parents hope. Parents who had kids that are mentally challenged saw Joey Moss living a relatively normal life, fitting into society and being accepted uh, as a, a regular person. And I think that gave parents of kids with handicaps uh, a great deal of hope. And I think that was the biggest thing that Joey Moss brought to his life uh, as far as helping other people. Um, so it was an honor for me to know him. He was a great friend. He lived with me off and on for a lot of years. And we spent a lot of time together. Just a wonderful young man and we'll truly miss him. Thanks very much, Wayne. Um, thanks very much for that. So uh, we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, first question to Jason or from Jason Greger, TSN 1260. Uh, Jason, go ahead. Uh, Wayne, my condolences. I know Joey was, was very close to you and your family. Mm -hmm. Can you share, you know, so many of your teammates had great stories about Joey and, and how he really integrated into that room so quickly. You mentioned mm -hmm. you were you were very comfortable because of your aunt, but were you surprised at how quickly Joe fit into the room and, and how important he came to your entire team? Um, <clears throat> it's a catch-22. Um, in some ways, I was surprised at how quickly he fit in, not only with the players, but with the training staff, um, Barry Stafford and Peter Miller and Lyle Kalchiski and then later on, Kenny Lowe. Um, but it showed not only how good of a team we had, but how good the people in the team were. Guys like Paul Coffey and Mark Messier, uh, guys like Lee Fogelin, uh, Yuri Curry, Grant Fuhr, Kevin. But more importantly, how Glenn let him come in and he didn't, he didn't treat him as a child who was working in our locker room with a handicap. If something was out of place, I can remember Glenn yelling at Joe, and Joe would jump up and run and do what he got to get done. Um, 
Gordy Miller and I were laughing about it yesterday that after a game, I could have eight or nine media guys around me. But if it was 1045 and Sparky said, it's 1045, we vacuum the floor, he would vacuum every guy's shoe that was around my stall. <laughs> so um, he fit in right from the get go. Everyone treated him with a great deal of respect. And we loved having him around, as simple as that. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, next question from uh, Mark Spector. Mm -hmm. We'll just unmute your mic. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, Wayne, you know, we've been blessed in Edmonton, of course, all these Hall of Fame players and all the Stanley Cups back then. But this is a different uh, accomplishment, I guess, right? right? Joey yeah. rose to these heights without ever putting a pair of skates on, right? Uh, yet, you know, the organization, I'm sure, is going to honor him in some way, but mm -hmm. this is unique. Every city's had lots of great players, but I would say, is there any city that's sort of, is there a comparable out there for Joey? And how would you honor a guy like that, you know, with going forward? <laughs> well, that's a great question. And I'm not sure there is a comparable anywhere. There's probably kids that go in and out of locker rooms for a short period of time. I don't know of any one person like Joey that spent, I guess, the better part of since 1982 when he started uh, working in the oiler room sort of part-time and then full-time in about 83, 84, and then full-time with the Eskimos. He has more championships probably than uh, Hugh Campbell. <laughs> He's got a lot of, a lot of jewelry. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I think that, First and foremost, the Oilers always do everything first class, you know, from everything they've done in the past to even, you know, the banner hangings, the prerequisite is you get your number hung in the rafters if you get in the Hall of Fame, which I think is cut and dry. And I think it's a great way to go. How will they'll honor Joey? I think that this is one time where maybe you reach out to people of Edmonton, uh, the fans of Alberta and the Oilers, and sort of get a sense and a feel. Do people maybe want um, a statue? Do people want a, a banner? Whatever the people and the fans and the Oilers decide to do, it'll be first class. It'll be something that we'll remember for a long time. Uh, we made people happy by winning. We made people excited by winning championships. Uh, he made people happy who might not have been hockey fans, but he gave them hope for their kids, uh, you know, and uh, I, I can't say enough about what he did to raise awareness, to show people that somebody with a handicap can still be part of society. And so we got to figure out the right way to honor him that'll last a lifetime. He deserves that. Thanks, Wayne. Mm -hmm. uh, Next question from uh, Rob Tichkowski. Rob, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Wayne, for doing this. I imagine uh, rolling into the Edmonton Oilers dressing room for Joey was probably a pretty nervous situation. It would be intimidating for anybody. How long did it take before he was Joey, you know, comfortable and trash talking with the guys and everything? And, and when did you realize that, you know what, this, this kid might be around for a while? Oh, well, let me tell you, you know, the fact that he grew up in a family – with 13 siblings, he was very comfortable uh, right from day one. Um, he never felt out of place. He, he just looked up and listened. I think the most nervous Joey was over <laughs> the first year was that, uh, as everyone knows, he loves to eat hamburgers and steak and potatoes, very much a Ukrainian boy. And Sparky got him on <clears throat> a little bit of a diet. I think that his, the most nervous Joey would be was coming to the rink wondering if he was going to be allowed to have a hamburger that day or have to have a salad. <laughs> so uh, I think from that point of view, he was more concerned about that stuff. But he, he fit in right from the beginning. He would get his work done early in the morning, and then as guys would sit around and get dressed for practice, he liked to go sit beside each guy or talk to a player. And the players were very comfortable with him. A lot of the guys would take him home and have dinners. Uh, and this went on not only with our group of guys, but then guys like Ryan Smith and Shane Corson and Dougie Waite. And then the new generation of players in the 2000s, they, they were all comfortable with Joey. And, you know, I remember sitting with Milan Lucic and Joey and Milan just smiling, sitting there as he was talking to Joe because Joe was so engaging. 
and he loved Edmonton. And he loved not only the Oilers, but the Eskimos too. And so he was just a special young man and he fit in from day one and he was, he was never out of place and we never made him feel out of place. We treated him like everybody else in the locker room. If we were teasing Barry Stafford or Lyle, we would tease Joey and he loved being part of that. And I know that guys like George the Rock and Dave Semenko would play wrestle with him in the locker room and he thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And he just, those are memories we can never replace. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, next question from uh, Jason Greger. Jason, go ahead. Wayne, two-parter, quickly. Did you ever wrestle with him in the room in, in front of the guys? <laughs> and <laughs> no. his his singing, did you ever? Did you guys ever take him karaoke or was it always just in the room? Um, I never wrestled him. Uh, when he was younger, uh, he was actually a pretty good athlete. Joey loved to play. We would play ball hockey on the road uh, in December, January, when it was 40 below. I remember one time we kind of went over a block, but it was so cold that we drove over, which was 25, 30 feet. It was half a block. And as the game ended, um, I remember Paul Coffey was there and Kevin was there. We sort of jumped in the cars and raced home because we were so cold. And about a half hour later, there was a knock on the door. And I remember I opened the door and Joey was standing there and he was completely frozen and he had tears in his eyes and his glasses were all fogged up. And I had a pit in my stomach because I never felt so bad that we actually forgot him <laughs> at the, at the uh, playground. So, you know, we played a lot of sports with him because he was pretty athletic. Joey sang a lot. Joey, uh, he used to come to uh, my fantasy camp in Vegas with Lyle and Dwayne. Um, I always seemed to have a band there and Alan Thicke would always sort of organize a little bit of a sing-along and Joey, he would always get on stage and he loved to sing O Canada. And then during the show, he would love to sing La Bamba. And a lot of my American friends who would come to my camp had never seen Joey and didn't know what to expect. And, once he sang O Canada, they, most of them had tears in their eyes. Um, and then Christmas dinner or Christmas parties that Glenn was big on a team Christmas party. That was the one event we always did. And Joey would inevitably sing La Bamba at the team Christmas party. And he would get a standing ovation and he would blow kisses to everyone. Um, he was, it was truly one of the fun parts of, uh, of our Christmas party every year. Thanks, Wayne. We've got time for a few more. Uh, Josh Clipperton. Josh, go ahead. Hey, Wayne. Uh, thanks. Thanks for doing this. My, my condolences as well. I'm, I'm just wondering if you could take us back to when, when the idea sort of was floated the first time to have to include Joey. Like, how did Glenn react, and sort of how did that all all play out? And was he excited? I mean, Joey was he excited. Was he nervous? How the first time he stepped in there? Well, it kind of started with. Um, he was working at a bottle depot, as everyone knows, and I thought that it didn't make a lot of sense that this uh, 18-year-old young man who had a handicap was standing, uh, taking a bus to work um, in 40 below weather. Um, and I remember standing there thinking, gosh, there's got to be something that I can do or we can do as a society that's going to make his life not better, but maybe easier and, and more comfortable for him. And that's when I went to Glenn with the idea and Glenn from day one was open arms and thought, okay, this would be great. And the only way it wasn't going to work is if he didn't fit in. But from the first moment he walked in that locker room, he understood that Lyle Kaczynski was going to be the guy that was going to guide him to do what he had to do. Um, as Lyle says to many people, Joey made all of us a better person and made Lyle a better person. So he fit in from day one. There was never an issue of, why you guys have this kid here he was comfortable he knew his responsibilities he didn't step out of line he was genuinely excited to come to work every single day and so um it worked out uh, from day one that he was great for us and i hope to think that we were great for him uh because uh it was sure always a breath of fresh air when we'd walk in the locker room and he'd be sitting there uh, having his cup of coffee and uh, he'd have his leg crossed and he'd be sitting there all excited to talk to the players. <laughs> okay, uh, last question to uh, Guillaume Lefrancois. Guillaume, go ahead. Yes, hi Wayne. Uh, can can you hear me? 
Okay, good. All right. Um, listen, I, I just wanted to go back on your departure from, from Edmonton and how you sort of handled that uh, and handled, uh, you know, how, how things were going to go moving forward after you left and how the organization would, uh, uh, would stick with, uh, with Joey. Oh, that, first of all, that never, I, I didn't even think about that because first and foremost, the, the players are all classy people and, the organization itself, they, uh, they, they were, well, they did, they trade me before Joey. Joey was a lifer. Um, you know, Edmonton has a great reputation as Sir Winifred Stewart school. And that's who we kind of linked with way back in 1980. And my good friend Ian Berrigan was a big part of uh, Sir Winifred Stewart. And he had a brother with uh, uh, that was mentally challenged. And so, when I met him, he was already involved with the school. And then from there, him and I started hosting golf tournaments and doing events and charity dinners. And like every other parent, Joey's mom's biggest fear was when she passed that Joey would have a proper place to live and be taken care of. And I knew the Oilers would always take care of Joey. I always knew that that was going to be part of being an Edmonton Oiler. And that's exactly what happened. But we built these homes and it was Ian Berrigan who was a big leader in that and Mr. Winifred Stewart School. We built these homes for kids to have a place to, to, uh, to live. And I know when his mom passed away, she was very happy and comfortable in the sense that he was gonna be taken care of, not only by these houses, but by, by his family and the people of Edmonton and by the Edmonton Oilers. So there was never concern from anybody's point of view that Joey wasn't gonna be a lifetime member of the Oilers Hockey Club and of the Edmonton football team. Paul Coffey and Kevin, and Mark and I, we used to sit around and we would laugh about it all the time that, you know, we're going to be gone and we're going to be moved on and retired and Joey's still going to be working in the Oiler locker room. And every time I walk in the Oiler locker room, the first thing I, I would say to the trainers, Jeff Lang and Harry, who were wonderful with Joey and took care of him, uh, where's my little buddy? Is he here today? And they'd say he's in having a coffee or he's in eating already. And so it was always brought a smile on my face that he was always accepted as part of the Edmonton Oilers locker room and the city of Edmonton uh, community. So I never was any fear of when I left that Joey would always be taken care of because that's what the Oilers do, and that's what Edmonton does. It takes care of people, and he was in the right place, and he made a lot of people happy.